Good morning, Calvary. It is Pentecost Sunday. It's here. It is the day in which we celebrate the Holy Spirit descending upon all of the people and us receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit. And this is such a wonderful and special day. Um, and in order to get started, I wanted to acknowledge the fact that there are lots of people who are at church on this day and they are probably hearing um, one type of sermon or another. One type of sermon probably um, is really emphasizing this idea of fire. In fact, if you look at our bulletin for the Sunday, we have a picture of Pentecost and all of the disciples have um, steam or fire coming out of the top of their heads because fire is very common imagery for Pentecost. But uh, we talked last Sunday about how the fires of Pentecost are not punitive fires or fires of damnation. They also aren't like the fires of Malachi. That's a refiner's fire that's purifying and cleansing. Rather, the fire of Pentecost is more of a fire of energy and of life. And so we celebrate that the Holy Spirit came upon all the people and gave them fire and energy. And for me personally, I also like to remind myself that Pentecost is taking place immediately on the hill, hills of Jesus' death and resurrection. And if you recall, most of the disciples behaved pretty badly after Jesus was crucified. We had Simon Peter who denied Jesus three times. We have disciples running off naked. We have disciples hiding in an upper room. We have people who are panicked and terrified and don't know what's going to happen. And so many of us like to um, hear those stories and think to ourselves, you know, if we were one of the disciples back then, we wouldn't have behaved so badly. We would have had a lot more faith and we tend to judge all of the disciples. But it's important to remember that even if we do end up judging them harshly, that on Pentecost Sunday, when the Holy Spirit descends upon all of the people and they are filled with energy and vigor, that does not exclude the disciples. The disciples receive the Holy Spirit just like everybody else. And it's a good reminder for all of us of no matter how much we may mess up, um, do something we shouldn't do, that God loves us anyway and God is not done with us yet. So that's one image that people tend to focus on on Pentecost Sunday, this idea of fire. And the other image is this idea of tongues or speaking in tongues. And I know I shared a couple of Sundays ago about how um, I grew up going to a private school that was affiliated with a Pentecostal church. And I discovered then that there are lots of Christian groups who believe that speaking in tongues is speaking in a special secret language of God and that someone has the gift of tongues and is able to speak in this language and then someone else has the gift of interpretation and is able to say, well, this is what, what they're saying right now. Um, and that's such an interesting uh, interpretation of speaking in tongues because that's not what the Pentecost story is about at all. Instead, the Pentecost story is a story about all of these people from all of these different places gathered together for a very particular celebration in the Jewish tradition. They're there for the Festival of Weeks. And this is a time where they celebrate the giving of the law. So all the people are gathered together for this festival and the Holy Spirit descends upon all the people. And even though everyone is different and everyone is speaking in his or her own language, they're all able 
still to understand each other and know what one another is saying. And lots of times we hear um, pastors talk about this story of Pentecost Sunday, and they talk about it through the lens of the Tower of Babel story from Genesis, in which the people are building a, a giant tower, and they're also trying to all speak the same language. And God looks upon them, and God sees their homogeny and how they're trying to all be the same. And God doesn't want that. God wants their diversity, and God wants their difference. And so then on Pentecost Sunday, then, when we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, um, and people are able to understand one another, it's important that they don't all speak the same language. It isn't like God goes back again. Instead, they're all able to understand their own languages. And so God is, maintains that uniqueness and that diversity, and God continues to celebrate that. And I think what's also interesting is that God equally empowers people of all different nations, of all different languages. There isn't one that is unique or special or one language that God likes or prefers more. And I think that those are important lessons uh, for us to remember and bear in mind. But I am not going to talk about um, fire and I'm not going to talk about tongues, uh, but I'm going to talk about a third image, which is the image of breath. And that is also a common image during the season of Pentecost, although it's less common than, uh, than fire or tongues. Um, and it's interesting to note that in both Hebrew and Greek, in both of those languages, the word that is used for breath, is also the word that is used for spirit and sometimes wind. So in Hebrew, you have ruah, and in Greek, you have pneuma, and um, we still have some words in the English language that harken back to this idea. So I think the most obvious is pneumonia, right? Which is an infection of the lungs and pneumonia that word comes from the Greek word pneuma. But with these few exceptions, we have all these different words that we use to mean either spirit or wind or breath. And it's not only fascinating to know that um, both of these languages thought of them as like inherently similar, but it's also important for us to remember that when we are reading an English translation of the Bible then, and we come across a word for wind or spirit or breath, that the person who is translating that word is making a choice in their translation of whether or not they're going to say spirit or whether or not they're going to say breath. Um, but in this idea of spirit and breath being interchangeable and woven together, it's interesting to go and look through scripture then and see how integral and important breath and spirit have been from the very, very beginning and how that continues on through the arc of scripture. So in the book of Genesis, the very first chapter, we're told that God's spirit's brooding over the waters, um, that God's breath is present over the waters. And then we just move one chapter later to another version of the creation story. And in this one, we have God creating Adam out of the mud. Um, and then God breathes on Adam and Adam is filled with the Spirit of God, is filled with life. And then we move on 
throughout scripture. We get to Ezekiel in the valley of dry bones and how Ezekiel looks out and sees all of these bones and God instructs Ezekiel to prophesy to the bones and God's breath fills the bones and they come together and they become these living things. And then we fast forward even more to the story of Jesus, death and crucifixion. And it's important to bear in mind that Jesus died <clears throat> a very distinct way. Yes, Jesus died through crucifixion because that was a method of determent um, that was reserved for people who uh, uh, the Roman government felt like was rebelling against them, um, was trying to undermine their power, it was a way of regaining their power. We, we've talked about all of that before. And so yes, crucifixion is significant in that way, but it's also significant because it is death by asphyxiation and is death by not being able to breathe. And <clears throat> the way crucifixion would work is that someone would be hung on a cross and then they would have to push up to be able to free up their lungs to be able to breathe. And this is why soldiers would go then and they would break their legs. Um, because if they broke their legs, then they weren't able to use them anymore to push up to gain that breath. And it would cause the people who have been crucified to die even faster. And that's why I think we're also, uh, you know, the choice is made that instead of it saying that Jesus, right before he died, said, da 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 da, instead it says, and Jesus breathed his last and said, it is finished because it is a death that takes away one's breath. And so we can see that <laughs> breath and spirit are interchangeable then. We can see that there is this arc throughout all of scripture of breath and of spirit. Um, but I think it's also important for us to talk about breath now because we have just come out of this time of COVID. And uh, some of you may be like, why, why are you talking about COVID? Can we be done talking about COVID? And um, hopefully one day we will be able to, to be done. But it wasn't until May 11th of this year that the public health emergency was lifted. Um, some of us may have felt like COVID was over a long time ago, but it was just this month that is officially over. And for three years, we were all thinking about breath because here was a virus that was transmitted through breathing, through droplets of air hanging in the sky. Um, and people would breathe it in and become ill, and then they would not be able to breathe on their own. And people who had a very, very serious case of COVID uh, would have to go to a hospital and be put on a respirator. And so we've all been thinking about breath and what that means and how important and special breath is. Um, but I have been thinking about breath on my own for a couple of months now because in having conversations with people the thing that I hear the most is that even though COVID is over, that people aren't okay. Uh, people are still traumatized by that time, um, still mourn that time, <coughs> still feel feelings of uh, fear and anxiety that stem from that time. All of these things that people carry with them. 
and in hearing about how people are still not okay, you know, three years later, I started to research like, well, what, what can you do to feel better? And time and time again, I kept coming across this idea of if you're stressed out, if you're worried, <coughs> and if you're in a perpetual long state of anxiety and worry, you end up stressing out your adrenal glands. And so in order to be able to relax, you have to shift from a sympathetic to a parasympathetic nervous system state. And then I started researching, well, you know, what do you do to switch into a parasympathetic nervous system state? And what you do, there, there's several things, but one of them is waking up and taking in the morning light first thing. Ideally, outside, barefoot, and taking in deep breaths. To tap into your parasympathetic nervous system, uh, you need to take deep breaths throughout the day. In order to tap into your parasympathetic state, you need to have humming or chanting or singing or gurgling or guttural vibrations throughout the day. Um, and in order to tap into that state, you need to meditate and that involves trying to relax your mind and relax your body and take in deep breaths. Almost, there are a couple more um, recommendations, but the vast majority of them all involved breathing and taking time to breathe and breathing deeply. And what I realized is that breath isn't just something that is vital that literally keeps us alive, but breath is also where we can access feelings of joy and peace and safety. And isn't it interesting then that the Spirit of God that stills our own spirits is the breath. I don't think it's any mistake then that both the Greeks and the Hebrews knew that breath and spirit were so interchangeable. And so it's my hope and my prayer that during the season of Pentecost, yes, we can celebrate fire and yes, we can celebrate tongues, but I also want us to focus on our breath, on our literal breath of breathing deeply, of trying to relax, of trying to come through COVID. But I also want us to focus on where we sense the breath of God, the Spirit of God, where is God present? And to lean into that and to let both of those things be what gives us our sense of joy. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.